you will, turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 16 and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. No, that's the wrong one. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Um, we're going to attempt to uh, use just the Bible. Um, I don't, you know, unlike a lot of preachers, they'll get up there and they want to correct the King James Bible by going to the Greek language. And they'll say the Greek word here really means, and they go on. What they don't tell you is that when they say the Greek her word here really means so and so and so and so, that all they did was look up in their Strong's Concordance what Greek word was being used in that verse at that place, and then they look up that Greek word and has meanings. But the thing is, every Greek word has three, four, and five different meanings. And they'll pick the one they want, and then they'll insert that meaning into that verse, changing your English Bible. Well, they don't... They won't admit to you that they don't know Greek. Um, I've had many talks uh, in the last few weeks about this issue, and, and somebody will change the Word of God here and there, and, and I, I call them on it every single time, and, and I say, why are you trying to change your perfect English Bible, my perfect English Bible, with a language that you don't know? And they go, well, it was originally in Greek and Hebrew. I said, well, I know that, but I'm not Greek or Hebrew. I'm, I'm English, so God gave me a perfect English Bible in 1611. It, it's been perfect for 402 years. Why do you think that you can go to a language that you don't know and try and fix it? And they'll say, yeah, but you don't understand. You can get so much more out of it. You know what, folks? I've been studying this thing for 24 years, and you can get more out of your Bible study just by believing it, not by going to a language you don't know. And so I usually will point out, after running around a few times around the block with them, I'll point out, let me ask you a question. If you truly believe that the Greek language is the best way, is where you're going to get the most meaning out of the Scripture, well then why have you not taken the six to eight years that it takes to get good at the Greek language? Why have you not already done that? Why are you still... But the thing is, they go to a verse like 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and they'll say, well, this word, whatever, inspiration, what it should mean or what it does mean, and they go on, well, that's not how you do it, folks. You don't do that in math class. Well, don't we all have the same book when you go to math class? Or same thing in history class? Now, if you turn over to Second Timothy, or Second Corinthians chapter 11, what I want to talk to you today is, and it's about this very issue, and it's about the subtlety of the devil and the simplicity of the gospel. See, the subtlety of the devil and the simplicity in Christ. It's very, very clear that the devil has a mission. And the mission is, is I'm going to go ahead and state the devil's mission statement for the age of grace. And that is, if you're not saved, the devil's goal is to keep you that way. To keep you from getting saved. Keep you from getting the information that you need to be able to believe and trust in the gospel of grace and so the devil's goal is to keep you from getting saved, and he'll use any means necessary. See, it's not just a devil, but there's devils. He has, I don't know how many, but he has an awful lot. One third of the angels from heaven fell with Satan, that old serpent. And now there's devils. The word demons never found in your King James Bible. That's a Greek mythology term. But the word devils is found many times. Now we have the simplicity of the... Um, of the gospel in Christ and the subtlety of the serpent. See, the second mission of the devil, if he can't keep you from getting saved, once he gets you saved, he wants to make you ineffective. Now, you know the greatest way to make a Christian who's already saved ineffective is keep them from studying this book. Keep them from meeting with other Christians. And keep them from trying to rely on God for things in their life and for protection and for happiness and for joy and for peace so the devil will use anything he possibly can 
One of the greatest ways I believe that the devil uses Christians is when they'll say, you know what? That word probably don't mean what it says right there. Maybe you should go to the Greek that you don't know and go ahead and, and fix it. Look at 2, Timothy, or 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse 3 and 4. The Bible says, But I fear, lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. See, Paul warns us here about the, the serpent who beguiled Eve through a subtlety. And he warns us that our minds could be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. See, it's very simple. But it's, you notice that the subtlety. Think about the word subtlety. I was thinking about this the other night. The word subtlety there. The subtlety that the serpent uses. He beguiled Eve, it says, through his subtlety. Well, if, you, if I said, hey, um, I want you to, to kind of let people know something, but be real subtle about it, then you understand that very simply, <coughs> don't you? To be subtle. It's a very simple thing, but it involves trickery and deceit. And that's how the serpent is. He's very, it's very simple. Just a little bit of trickery thrown in, a little bit of deceit thrown in, and that turns into the tool of the devil. Look over, if you will, to Genesis chapter 3, and let's look at that, where that verse is talking about. You want to read a little bit about how the serpent beguiled Eve through a subtlety. In Genesis chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 1. In verse 1, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? See that question mark right there? That's the very first time a question mark appears in your King James Bible. The very first time a question is ever asked in your Bible is asked by that old serpent, the devil. And it asks, he asks Eve in a very subtle way. And he just says something very simple. Yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Let's see how she responds. Verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Well, God didn't say that. God didn't say that you can't touch it lest you die. But she adds a little bit to scripture. Devil sees her on the hook. He starts to reel it in. Verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He just adds one little word. In verse 3, it says, Ye shall not eat of the... No, excuse me. In verse 2, he says... Oh, I'm sorry. In verse 1, I'm backing up little by little, my eyes going up. In verse 1 at the end, he says, Yea, hath God said, you should not eat of every tree of the garden? And then in verse 4, he just adds one little word. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, we know the story as it goes on. But let me ask you this. Was the devil lying right there? Seems to me like he was lying. Look what he tells her. For Verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, yes, their eyes were open, and they would know good and evil. But would they be like gods? If they're like gods, then you're like gods. Because Adam's our great, 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 great granddaddy. They weren't like gods, were they? See how subtle he is? Real subtle. 
and it just involves a little bit of trickery, a little bit of deceit. In verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, because she wanted to be like God's. Now how can that fruit, think about this, was it pleasurable to the eyes? Sure. Was it one to be desired? Absolutely. But look at how it ends. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. She believed the devil, didn't she? She said, oh, you mean if I eat that, I'll be like God's? Oh, I'm going to have some of that. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig, excuse me, fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Have you ever felt a fig leaf? Kind of scratchy, ain't it? You want to make your underwear out of fig leaves? Man, I mean either. Were they like gods? <laughs> Did they get really, really wise and smart because they ate that fruit? So was the devil lying? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's how the devil will do. See, the devil will say things like, come on now. You can look up a word in the Greek and fix that old King James Bible. Just change that little word right there and make it what you need it to be. He's very subtle like that, you see. I had this... Um, this one couple that I had spent time at, uh, doing a Bible study, they went to our church, um, and I, I did a Bible study in their home and for months and months and months. And then he got promoted to a different place in another, uh, we were in, in uh, Fort Walton Beach, Florida, and he got promoted down by um, Mickey Mouse World. Okay? So he goes down there and he finds a church. Hey, Pat, he goes, this thing is, it's King James only. And it's, it's, you know, they rightly divide the word of truth. And I said, well, praise the Lord. Good deal. And so he says, um, you guys ought to come down and go to Mickey's house. And I thought that was a pretty good idea. So we pack up the family. We went down there to go see Mickey. And we made it over a weekend. And he says, I want you to meet my pastor. He is good. He's teaching me so much stuff. And over the phone, the more I talk with him, the more I realize this pastor's teaching him some kind of crazy stuff. So I go over to his, um, I go to his church, and his pastor can't go five seconds without changing a word in the Bible. He, yeah, he's using the King James Bible, but he's abusing and using the King James Bible. And I mean, I, I'm not even exaggerating. In a 30-minute sermon, there was at least 30 to 40 times that he corrected what the King James Bible said and would say this word should be um, translated as, or he would say the things like, well, that word means, and it would be something that that word doesn't mean that in English. Or then he would say the Greek here is whatever, and he would say a Greek word, sound fancy. And so this guy, Michael Yurik, and his wife, say, he goes, you've got, we're having a potluck dinner afterwards, and we're having you know, the, uh, all these people over to my house, and the pastor and a whole bunch of the, the men folk and the women folk, and of course I'm staying in his house for the weekend. I knew I was stuck. And so he goes, you got to talk to my pastor. I'm like, I, I don't want to do this in front of all these people from his church. That's just not polite. So I, I avoided it like the plague. Well, let me tell you what happened. They kept on pushing me. Oh, come on over here and talk to my pastor. You know, and I'm trying to talk about, boy, isn't it beautiful weather outside? And don't you love living around the Orlando area? And, and he wants to, Michael is trying to get me locked into a Bible discussion with him about doctrine. And I'm avoiding it with everything I have in me. And then finally the pastor starts trying to prod me. Oh, come on, brother. Uh, if you have questions about the sermon today, ask me. Come on now. And I'm like, don't do this. And I said, no, no. I, I mean, I'm sure we can have a talk. Let's just it's fellowship. Let's eat some food. And, and he goes, oh, come on. So he's got like these four or five men sitting in this little circle. He calls me over across the room. And uh, says, come on now, if you have Bible questions, you know, I know that you're in Bible school and you have questions, go ahead and ask them. So I said, okay. <laughs> I went, chuk, chuk. <laughs> I double cocked it and I got both barrels up and I said, you know what, you are amazing when you were preaching. 
you were able to just rattle off all those Greek words and those Greek meanings and all those different things. And, and it was just, it was impressive. I'll give you, I was impressive. I, I don't, I've never met somebody who's that good at Greek like that. It's, it's crazy. I said, let me ask you, um, if I just, because you, you're just amazing at it. I said, so if I just pull up a, a Bible verse, you know, a little paragraph or whatever, will you do me a favor and just translate that? And of course, I'd be in the New Testament. Would you just translate that, but speak it in Greek? And he goes, oh, come on, brother. You don't want me to do that. Real subtle, you see. And I said, oh, come on. He goes, oh, come on, brother. You don't, you don't really want me to do that. He says, you know, that, how, how, what would you get out of that? How boring would that be? You wouldn't know what it was even saying. And I said, come on. I said, okay, well, you won't do it. He wouldn't do it. I tried about three or four times. And then I said, let me, okay, well, do me this favor then at least. Because I, I said, I know some little tiny bit, you know, uh, alpha, um, beta, kappa, delta, epsilon. You know, but, you know, I don't know a whole, but I don't know all, even the whole alphabet. Can you go ahead and just, just rattle off the alphabet to me? Just so I can hear it, how cool it sounds. And all those people go. And he goes, oh, you don't want me to do that, brother. Come on now. You're putting me on the spot now. Real subtle, see? See, all his people in his church, they thought that he was this Greek expert. Because he could correct the King James Bible left and right. Mike was so impressed with his knowledge of Greek. That's why he wanted me to talk with him. Why I tried to avoid talking to him. But once that pastor was trying to try to goat me into it, I said, okay. You, we want to do this in front of everybody. Let's go. And so I asked him. And he didn't. I asked him again. He wouldn't. I didn't really want it, he said. And then finally I said, let me ask you one more question. Do you know took a sip of my drink. Do you know how many letters are in the Greek alphabet? I said, I know there's 26 in English, but how many letters are in the Greek alphabet? And he goes, um, I don't know. I said, okay, so you mean to tell me that you're going to correct my perfect King James Bible with a language that you not only don't know, that you cannot just translate by reading it, but well, you don't even know how many letters are in the Greek alphabet or what those letters are? What gives you that right? So, folks, you're never going to find me up here just quoting off a Greek term and what does it mean and, and tell you that because I don't, I don't have no, I'm not, I can't have any, you know who has the authority around here? The Word of God. I have no, uh, you know, I have authority here in the church as the pastor, but I don't have any authority in your personal life. If you want to study the Bible, you go home and you study it. And you read it, but you believe what you read. And you're going to learn more than any of those people out there who try and correct it. Look over at Mark, or excuse me, John chapter 8. See, that first he questions the Word of God. Then he changes the Word of God. Then he lies about them being like gods. That's what the devil's like. Let's look at that old serpent a bit. Look at John chapter 8. We're going to just, just look at what the devil, what his job is in the Bible and what he does. Look at John chapter 8 and look at verse 44. John chapter 8 verse 44. Jesus Christ is speaking and he says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and bode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Now let's get some context. Back up to verse 33. And let's see what was going on there. Jesus Christ is out there with his disciples. In verse 33, they answered him, um, these people that the Lord Jesus Christ is talking to, they answered him, We be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. 
Now, what was Jesus talking about when he said, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed? He's talking about getting saved, right? He's talking about you're going to be free from your sins. Look at verse 37. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. Oh, he's loading both barrels. Look at verse 39. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil. And the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. What does that mean, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own? Because he knows what he is. He's a liar. Look how it continues. For he is a liar and the father of it. See, when the devil speaks a lie, he knows about speaking lies because he's the father of liars. The devil, that old servant, folks, is alive and well today in Prattville, Alabama, and in every city across the United States and across this world. Look at Job chapter 1. Let's go back to the Old Testament real quick. Just a couple of places. Look at Job chapter 1, about the middle of your Old Testament. If you find Psalms, back up one book. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, this is Satan in the past. Look at verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also with among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Look at verse 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now what do you suppose that Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and did? Read book, the book of Job. He messed with Job. Met, took away his children, his cattle, e I mean, just, just everything. But I want you to notice something where when God asks him, where have you been, Satan? Look at verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in, in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Folks, the devil is not in hell waiting for people to get there. See, a lot of people think that's the case. They think the devil is in hell, like, ruling the place. You see it in movies and in cartoons and stuff, and he's like the king of hell, and he's ruling the place. They're mistaking that with the Greek mythology, Hades. In hell, the devil's not there yet. He's walking to and fro in the earth. Look at 1 Peter. 
Now let's look into the future, into the tribulation period. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm trying to use up your clean pages, get them a little more scuffed up. That's why I'm having you go bouncing back and forth like that. 1 Peter chapter 5. And look at verse 6. The Bible says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He calleth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. So you see what the devil is doing in the, in the time past there in the book of Job. You see what he's going to be doing in the tribulation period. Well, what about right now? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. What's that old serpent up to right now? Well, for preachers, let me tell you what he's about. Remember, he's the father of liars. 1 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 6 and 7. He's talking about the office of a pastor, and he says, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So for, for preachers, see, I have to worry about falling into the condemnation of the devil, and I have to worry about the snare of the devil. That's why it's very important to pick out your pastor properly. Now, what about, what about for every Christian? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 26. I just want to run through some verses real quick before we sit down for a second and look at this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26. And that they may re recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So you think the devil's still going around doing devilish type things? Yeah. And you know what? He's real subtle. He doesn't have a pitchfork. He doesn't have big giant red horns and he's not all red in the face. He's real subtle. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. We read this today in Sunday school. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So those are seducing spirits, not the Holy Spirit, and doctrines of devils. So what do we do? If that's the devil's job, to be that subtle, what do we do? Look at Ephesians chapter 6. There's only one thing that we can do. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. We've got to put on the whole armor of God. Look at Ephesians 6 and look at verse 11. The Bible says, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. This is right now, folks. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's a lot of stuff to wrestle against, isn't it? And by the way, he's talking to save people. Well, see, the devil can't get me. Really? See, the devil only has, once you're saved, the devil only has one job, and that's to make you ineffective. Make you ineffective Christians. He don't want you leading other folks to the Lord. Look at verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to, to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We're coming back to that verse. 
Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Folks, look at verse 15 again. Part of the armor of is have your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, the only offensive weapon against the devil, look what it is. Verse 17, in the middle. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Folks, we are in a battle against that old serpent who's subtle, more subtle than any beast in the garden. And if we're in that battle, and what you have for your only offensive weapon is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and then you want to change the Word of God and say, well, it doesn't really say that there. And then if you corner somebody about that, are you saying that that word there is translated wrong? Well, I'm not saying it's translated wrong. Well, then why did you change it? Well, I'm just saying that it should be something different. Well, isn't that a wrong? Well, I'm not saying that. Let me ask you a different way. Do you believe that there is any Bible that's in English that's perfect and pure? And they'll say no, if they're honest. Once they say, no, there's no perfect and pure Bible, they go, but the King James is the best. Well, I don't want the best. I'm in a battle against the devil. I want the sword of the Spirit, not a little butter knife. I need a sword. I need the Word of God. If it, is it in English? And they go, well, there's no perfect translation in English. Well, then why are you not taking the six to eight years to get really good at Greek and then six to eight years to get really good at Hebrew? So that you can have a perfect word of God. We're in a battle, folks, with the devil. But he says in verse 15, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What's that gospel? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And don't worry, I'm watching the time. Last week was the um, first one in three and a half years where I went 15 minutes over, didn't I? And I told you up front, I warned you, so if you needed to leave, go ahead and leave. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't do that again, unless I warn you. Probably in about three and a half years. Okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at verse 1. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Now let's look at this for a second. Which I preached unto you, which also have received, and wherein you stand. Look at verse 2. We're going to sit on verse 2 for a second. By which also ye are saved if. Now you know what if is. I've told you this before. If is a very small word with a very big meaning. So let's see what that if is. It's a conditional statement. By which also ye are saved if. Ye keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you have believed in vain. We're coming back to verse 2. And here's the gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That's part one. Verse four. And that he was buried, part two. And that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's part three. It's three parts. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's it. That's the gospel. But there was an if back in verse two, wasn't there? Let's look at back at verse two. By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Well, you can believe this gospel in vain. Now, what does that mean? Well, if I go to 99% of Americans and I say, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross? They'll go, yeah. You say, do you believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins? They'll go, yeah. Do you believe he was buried, rose again the third day? They'll say, well, yeah. Are they all saved? No, because you can believe in vain. Now, what does it mean to believe the gospel, but to believe it in vain? That means that you believe the historic, historic facts of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but you believe them only as historical facts. You don't believe them, you believe them in vain. In vain, what does that mean? Well, the Greek word here is, just kidding, okay? In vain, for no, no reason. For no purpose, for no end. Unless you have believed in vain. You see, 
you have to understand in order to be saved by this gospel, you have to believe it, but not in vain. You have to trust it. You have to personally believe that when Jesus Christ died on that cross, that he took your sins. See, you can't get saved for me, and I can't get saved for you. When I got saved, it was because I, for the first time in my life, I saw that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died for Gilbert Shellen. He had me in mind. He had my sins. And he died for those sins. And when he was buried and rose again for my justification, it was for me, whether any of y'all had ever been born. He died for Gilbert Shellen. See, when I believed it, I trusted that gospel. And I said, you know what? If Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins 2,000 years ago, and all of my sins were put onto him, and he took them and forgave them, covered them with his blood, well then, I'm forgiven. Done. I can't do anything to earn that, can I? I can't do any works in order to be saved. Look over to Ephesians. See, in verse 1, you received it. Verse 2, you can believe it in vain. Verse 3, it says, receive it again. Look at Ephesians 1 in closing. Ephesians chapter 1, and look at verse 13. We'll look at two verses and we're done. Verse 13 says, in whom ye also trusted. Okay, so, see, there's some people that say, well, you believing the gospel, that's a work. No, it's not. It's an intellectual decision to trust what Jesus Christ did. See, unless you believed in vain, well, you can believe it in vain, but see, but believing it without the in vain is how you get saved. You believe the gospel. Let's see what it says right here. In whom, all, in whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You see, the gospel is something you can believe in vain because the gospel is something you can just, well, I believe that, that thing, those things happened. But see, I identified myself with the cross. I identified myself with Jesus Christ and he died personally for my sins. Not just the sins of the whole world, but he died for my sins. Well, if Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and was buried and rose, rose again the third day for my justification, see, it was personal, folks. I had to believe the gospel. I had to trust in the gospel. And that alone, believe that, trust that. And that's not a work. Did it take me? Not for the requirements of salvation, but it took me believing it and trusting it. Otherwise, everybody in the whole world would be saved. You have to believe that gospel, trust that gospel. Not in vain, though. Don't just believe the historic facts that Jesus Christ was around 2,000 years ago and he was died and buried. I mean, you can watch The Passion of the Christ. You can watch um, This Christmas is Coming Up. And you're going to have all sorts of specials about Jesus. Believing those facts don't make you saved. Believing that he, and trusting that he did it for you personally, that's when you get saved. And according to verse 14, you can't lose it. Look at the verse 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. See, he purchased you with a price. You know what that price was? His own life on Calvary. His own precious blood. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for everything you've given to us, Lord. We thank you for the blessing of being able to be saved. I thank you that you uh, shed somebody show me the gospel that I could trust in, Lord, that I might be able to um, receive salvation. I appreciate very much, Lord, every day. I thank you for the things you give me in my life. I don't deserve any of them, but most of all, I thank you for dying on the cross for me personally. Lord, I pray if there's someone within the sound of my voice that's never trusted the gospel, never believed what you did for them personally, I pray that that person would get saved and just simply give up. Just simply trust the gospel that you said you did, that you did it for us personally. And just trust it. Lord, I ask these things in Jesus' name and for sake. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.